Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Jessica, I am here with my amazing co-host. Uh, your name is? Hi, uh, thank you for that. I'm Jen. Nice to be here. <laughs> and uh, we are really excited to have our guest here today, um, Max Brooks. Uh, you wrote a bunch of things, including World War Z and de-evolution, and you were, um, you were a writer for SNL for a while as well? Yes, yes. And, and to... To quote you, I have written a lot of things. You have written a lot of things, including uh, what we're going to talk about today makes you one of my kids' favorite people because my kids are huge Minecraft fans. And uh, you wrote, is it, a, is it a trilogy officially? Yes. Yes. This is the third and final book of the Minecraft trilogy, which which started with the first official Minecraft novel, Minecraft the Island, and then Minecraft the Mountain, and now we're going into Minecraft the Village, the, the natural end to this story. Excellent. Well, very cool. Um, I have two eight-year-olds, and they love Minecraft, and uh, we frequently take them to bookstores, and hmm. yes, frequently. I know I'm a librarian, maybe <laughs> that's kind of, I don't know if that's considered like... Um, I don't know. It's not, it's not fraternizing with the enemy because Jen and I met at a bookstore. We both worked at a bookstore. Um, and I think that bookstores and libraries have, we, we can be, we can be friends, but uh, I took them to that section and the middle grade readers. And I was like, did you know that there are books about Minecraft and they just tore through it and they were really excited. So um, thank you for, for writing books in this universe. Oh. That get my kids really excited. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I, I get, it was such a pleasure uh, writing these books. Uh, many, many years ago when my boy was little and he started playing Minecraft, I realized that this game had so much potential as a teaching tool. And uh, when they, when Mojang, or Mojang, you know, they're Swedish, uh, when they reached out to me, they asked, would you be interested? Do you have a take? And I said, oh my God, yes, yes. This game is just, the potential is endless. So I came up with the idea of this character, which is, which wakes up in the Minecraft world, doesn't know who they are, doesn't remember their old life, has no idea what this world is like. And in the first book, uh, wakes up in the ocean, spawns, oh my God, we're drowning, uh, has to swim to an island and essentially becomes Robinson Crusoe and doesn't just learn how to survive in the island, also learns about himself, learns life lessons you know, patience and planning, uh, how to take life in steps, how to recover from failure. That's a real big one. And then the final lesson after he's turned this island into a comfort zone is that growth can't come from a comfort zone. It's time to go. So he builds a boat, paddles away. We get to book two, the, the mountain where he gets to a continent and finds another castaway just like him. And they have to learn how to be friends because they've both sort of been king and queen of their prospective worlds they've created. Now they have to learn to share and compromise and communicate. And that's book two. And they, they move on trying to find their way home. And then this new book, book three, they come to a village and they learn how to be citizens in a community. So it's all those big civics lessons they don't teach in school anymore. Uh, you know, why do we have laws? Why do we have uh, punishment for breaking those laws? Why do we vote versus just having a king? Uh, why is money good? And how could money be bad, depending on what you do with it? And then war. Why do wars happen? And what if you're not looking for a war, but it comes to you, whether you want it or not? And how do you win? And how do you survive? So big, big, heavy stuff, but told through the language of Minecraft. 
I think that sounds so cool just in terms of like taking something that kids love and sort of making like the lessons a little bit less implicit and a little bit more like a parent, you know, because a lot of that stuff is in the game already that you're kind of building on. And uh, I'm kind of curious about, you know, what is it that you think uh, draws kids to the Minecraft games and maybe not kids? Because I know, you know, there are players of all ages. And how do you try to how do you capture that on the page? I think one of the reasons it's such a great teaching tool is its flexibility and how it lends the problem solving skills to individuality, which by the way, that's how the world is working. You know, for hundreds of years, we were all compressed into this industrialized uh, method of work and education where basically the point was to become standardized, do what everyone else is doing and whoever does it the fastest and the bestest uh, wins the game. And that you could see it in business, you could see it in war, you could see it, like I said, in teaching. And that's all going away, especially now with young people. They're going to have to learn to solve problems their own way. They're going to have to dig into their own skill sets and figure out, well, how do I do this? And Minecraft's perfect. You know, you're given like a, a simple solution or a simple problem. Don't starve. But unlike the video games of my generation, there are many ways to do it. You can forage or you can fish or you can hunt or you can farm uh, and, or you can even scavenge. And I won't spoil too much about book one, but you know the first food source my character comes across is zombie flesh uh, chased with milk. And it ain't great, but it's a way to survive, which FYI, that's how humans first did it. We were scavengers. So Minecraft is amazing in doing it your way. And I think kids, grown-ups too, but you know, let's be honest, this is mostly for young people, uh, are excited to figure out problem solving their way. It's a source of pride. You know, look at my farm, look at how I'm growing food, or look at my hunting method, or personal survival. You know, look how I'm staying alive using all these different resources, which, you know, th like I said, this is the world. You know, we bemoan, oh, kids today, they have too many choices. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you learn to craft your own survival skill. Are people really saying that kids have too many choices? I love giving my kids choices, I have to say. Um, you know, I think that that is, as you were saying, it's really important, uh, you know, because there there are so many ways that that you can go um in in real life and one of the things that i really like about you know when my kids play minecraft is as you were saying like they are given like a world and they really have to sort of figure out for themselves how they're going to survive in it and i think it's super fun for them um to read a book that conceptualizes all of that and also just kind of builds suspense you know because obviously when you're playing you have your own situation you know you're you're trying to to get into but um when you're reading when you're reading a book it i, I don't want to say you know pe people still think of video games a certain way and they're saying oh well books are superior to video games it kind of marries a little bit of both, I think. Um, and it makes you think about how somebody else might sort of play the game. And uh, I guess that is that is really interesting to me as well, you know, because you're living in your own head when you're playing and you're building and this sort of brings something completely new to it. Um, and yeah, did you uh, play Minecraft? Oh, yeah, I had to. I had to. Every every book I write, I have to do an insane amount of research because I want the reader to trust me that I know what I'm talking about. And so I had to, you can't just learn about Minecraft. You can't just watch a few YouTube tutorials and maybe play an hour or so. Like, you got to really immerse yourself because that's the only way to to really understand the randomness of gameplay. That's one thing. Uh, I, I have, it's not a joke when I say at the beginning of all these Minecraft books, the following is based on true events because everything that's happened in the books at some point has happened to me, the Minecraft player, and the challenge was weaving them into a story. I have one example where in Minecraft, the island, my character is trapped. He's underground. He's in a mine shaft. He's almost out of arrows. He's got one arrow left. Here comes a creeper. The creeper's vibrating. He fires. 
and a bat flies right in his path and takes the arrow. Uh, that actually happened to me. I always come from the point of view of a reader. And I want my writer to know what they're talking about. So that's important. So the randomness of gameplay and also the emotion, you know, the frustration of spending so much time and effort building a house from scratch, you know, making the tools, cutting the wood, fashioning it into planks and doors and, and making this big, beautiful house and then having it burn down that crushing disappointment. And then the life lesson with it, which is, you, you've got to recover. Recovering from failure is one of the most important life lessons ever. Uh, so that could have only come from me building a house in Minecraft and watching it burn down. So I want every reader to know I'm with you. I'm right in it. I'm not just making this stuff, stuff up. I'm not just fudging it so I can get through this. No, no, no. I take my work really really seriously i love everything that you did because um you know previous to this i had framed a question around this idea of like yes giving a narrative to an open world game you know and as you were talking i realized yes okay like yeah the player the player of any game is in the middle of a story you know and it has a beginning and a middle and an end and many stories as you say yeah like the the story of like the rise and fall of your house or of like this particular hunt or what have you so is that something that you were thinking that like yeah by sort of taking the place as the player that's also like how you're gonna like that's the buy-in for the kids too because they're gonna like kind of live vicariously through that if that makes sense Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're going to uh, I think one of the challenges, not just in writing this book, but in writing every book is justifying your choices. You know, you can't you can't just have your characters. Obviously, they can't always make good choices because then you have no story. But if they make bad choices, they have to be justifiable bad choices. You know, they can't just make it because people even kids are savvy enough to say, oh, come on. Like you can't just do something because it's a, a, a thinly veiled plot device. So if my character doesn't know how to make a certain tool, there are times when actually he steps out and writes to you, the reader, and says, look, okay, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I just do A, B, and C? Well, I didn't know how to do that back then. Okay, so, you know, cut me some slack. So there's got, there's got, to, be, there's got to be psychological justifications for why you make bad choices to move the plot along. Do you find um, yourself when you're writing uh, for kids uh, versus adults, um, <clears throat> building suspense in a different way? Or do you feel like you're using similar building blocks for lack of a better phrase? No, no. I, th I think for, for both kids and adults, uh, there, I think there's ways in which you can tell it. Uh, I mean, I think for kids, the language, the language for me should be simpler, but not so simple that I'm talking down. I, I always like putting in a few words that would make kids go, oh, what does that mean? Because, you know, I, I don't believe in pandering. You know, I remember I was talking to the actor Thomas Jane once, and he said, he told me how excited he was to go see Star Wars and how he didn't understand half the movie. He was a little kid, but he's like, the feeling he got from watching this movie that was above him felt like your older brother invited you out with his friends. And that's how I want kids to feel. I, I don't want to just meet them at their level. I want to meet them there and then say, hey, let's, uh, let's take it a step higher. Uh, so that's important. I will say the response to the Minecraft books, because it is a younger audience, is so much nicer than my grown up books. I'm gonna be so sorry to say goodbye to this world because the, the grown up books are very snarky. You meet people at Comic-Con or at book signings and they're like, yeah, I wouldn't have done it that way. Or like with World War Z, your book sucked and Brad Pitt ruined it. Well, well wait a minute, if it sucked, how did Brad Pitt, anyway, whatever. But whereas in Minecraft, oh my God, what the compliments. These little kids were like, thank you, Mr. Brooks. I really like your book. Could you please write another one? And then the parents, I actually have gotten the best compliments ever, ever from parents. You can actually see some on Amazon where it's like, my child has never read a book. And then they picked up your book and now they're reading. 
Now, for a guy like me who was a dyslexic kid who struggled in school heavily and hated reading, I would rather have that than any sort of literary prize the world could ever make up. That's it. You don't go, you can't go anywhere from there. That's super interesting. And I guess if you could talk about it a little bit more, like it does occur to me now that like when you are writing for children, like you are an ambassador for this book, but you are also an ambassador for reading, you know? Like, oh you know, my God. Yeah. So are you know? kidding? Yeah. No, no. An, an ambassador. That's exactly right. Getting kids to read was always hard. And I'm sorry, but one of the problems were the grownups because a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times the teachers who became English teachers were those kids themselves who naturally just loved reading, right? They just jumped in. And I've had more than a few English teachers growing up who were so frustrated uh, that kids just naturally didn't have that love of reading. They didn't understand that, that even for kids who liked it, it's a discipline. It takes practice. Um, so getting kids to read especially now is harder because you're competing against TikTok. You're competing against screen time. So meeting them with something they already love, like Minecraft, is exactly how you do it. It's how I was when I was a kid. The first thing I ever read was a comic book, uh, Rom the Space Knight, a first annual. First time I ever just sat down and read something cover to cover because uh, I was interested because I had the Rom toy. So I was like, oh, Oh, cool. There's a comic of the action figure I have. You know, what, whatever is interesting to kids, find a book for it. Because I guarantee you there is a book out there. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And kind of to go one step further, as somebody who did spend 15 years in the children's department, um, I am an advocate of not forcing... <sighs> God, I'm so sorry, people. I know there are people who are going to be like, how could you say that? Do not force your kids to read the classics. If oh, God, they don't no. Want to, not yet. Not yeah. yet. Right? Do not. Oh, God. I remember. <laughs> I mean, I tell the story all the time. Eighth grade, our English teacher, he thought he was being cool by letting us all choose a book to read. And I'll never forget my friend says, like, I want to read a Stephen King book. And the teacher not only goes off on him, is like, that's not literature, then uses it as a teaching moment to shame the kid. And talk about, well, a student just came up to me and asked if you can read Stephen King. Absolutely not. That's not literature. Uh, okay, so 14-year-old boys going through puberty. Let's get back to reading Maya Angelou. Congratulations. You probably just wiped out this kid's, like, budding love of reading. No, the classics will always be there. My father, when I was, I don't know, in my 20s, gave me Walden. Uh, I didn't read it. I didn't read it back then. You know when I read it? Two years ago during the pandemic. So the classics will be there. They will come to them in their own sweet time. Start, start, come on, crawl before you can walk, people. Don't be snobby. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, honestly, like, I think I remember a book fair where all I wanted was the novelization of Gremlins too. And I read that book oh. cover to cover. Everybody was like, ah, oh, really? And I'm like, no, I'm reading that. And it was glorious. And this, I was somebody who at the time I don't like reading. And it was really just, I just wanted something that I felt connected to already. And, you know, like you're like, right. Right. You're going to you're going to find a lot of um, a lot of stuff out there. And I always like to say that like today's classics was somebody's junk in the past because like Shakespeare at one point was considered, you know, I don't know. Fluff oh, God. Yeah. Folk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, we lose track of the fact that in order to grow readers, we really need to entice them to read. And there has to be something that they want something that they connect with. And, you know, that's another thing. When I was in the children's room, I would always advocate for the kids to read Pokemon books because why not? You know, right. I mean, there's, there's something about that, which kind of brings me to something else I wanted to sort of mention about these Minecraft books. These are the first official Minecraft books. Um, yes. available. You know, for a while, the children's room, you know, people were asking for them. We had the, um, we had the uh, like the guides, 
how, um, you know, I mean, it must have been like really cool to be asked to write the first official book for Minecraft. Yeah, it was very scary uh, because it was because it's someone else's idea. You know, I'm I'm working for them and I don't want to I don't want to mess it up. And uh, that first book actually took a lot of drafts, took 10 drafts to get that thing right, uh, because it was finding the right tone, the right voice. Um, you know, meaning of the minds with Mo Yang about sort of what they wanted. And I didn't get to be on my high horse and be like, well, this is my book. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, it's my book, but it's their world. So it, it, it's definitely, you feel the weight on your shoulders. Also, you feel the, the, the pressure of uh, Minecraft players. You know, people who, who, are waiting for this book and are waiting to tell you that you've messed up their world. So that, so I, I def, that was definitely very scary uh, doing, doing that and, and praying to God that people liked it. Speaking of audience and stuff like that, um, cause as we've covered already, like there are multiple audiences, even like within children of like precocious readers and beginner readers. Um, the books have a lot of Easter eggs about the game in them that are like really delightful for like the very uh, knowledgeable, let's say, players who are now reading the books. Um, do you also try to balance that with like readers who are newer to Minecraft and the world? Or is this like targeted at like the diehards or like how do you envision your audience? No, no. I, I wanted to target it for everybody because I wanted this book to be read not just by kids, but by parents to kids. And I don't, didn't want the parents to be bored out of their mind, you know, just swimming through obscure references and things that only expert players would know because it's boring. I took the model from Sesame Street where, you know, they throw a same and the Muppet Show. Like I grew up on that kind of stuff where there were it was for me, it was for the child, but there were enough references to keep the parents engaged. Uh, and I think that's really important. So I I wanted parents who did, knew nothing about Minecraft to be able to sit there and read to their kids and still read a good story. And that's important. Uh, rule number one of any storytelling is it's got to be a good story before it's anything else. Uh, so that's why I kept, while I did, you know, immerse myself in the game and I really obeyed the rules of it, uh, I also wanted to make it palatable enough for people who've never played as a follow-up, I think that's also super useful because um, I remember when Minecraft was kind of new, there was like a tiny kind of like moral panic about it. You know, it's like, this is junk food or kids are wasting their time. They're not learning anything in here, you know? And like the game, I think demonstrates it itself, but like your book in particular, like really demonstrates that like there are lessons here to be learned and that like, you know, the kids can grow up with the lessons because like the way that you've structured the books around like, you know, individual uh, lessons and then like about your place in the world and how you relate to others. So like, yeah, is that something you think about too? Always. Well, and I also, I'm not under any sort of, you know, illusion that all the lessons in the book are all going to be absorbed by the kids the moment they read it. That's not how life works. You know, you spend your, your, your early life with older people talking at you. And you roll your eyes and you're like, oh, God, I don't understand what they're talking about. Or, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then, you, you know, then you get to be a teenager you think you know everything. Uh, but then you actually go out into the world. And then if you're lucky, when you were a kid, enough smarter people than you were telling you enough lessons that they start to suddenly blossom, like seeds buried under the ground in winter. Uh, you know, I've spent my 20s, 30s, 40s, and now I'm in my 50s looking back and being like, oh, that's what they meant. I actually just went out to lunch with my old 11th grade AP U.S. history teacher and and just just showered him with compliments about like, you know, dude. You said all this stuff to us that totally went right through me when I was 17. And now I look at the world through your eyes. I can't turn on CNN being like, oh, I wonder what Tom Leaches would think looking at this. So I'm not hoping that kids will suddenly close the Minecraft books and be like, yes, now I understand democracy versus autocracy. What I'm hoping for is 20 years later, maybe someone will say, oh, yeah. 
remember when I was a kid, there was a book about this. You know, I think like that also kind of speaks to just sort of the steps of your three books. There's, you know, like there's the person who's alone trying to figure things out. Then there's, like you mentioned, the the two people, and then you get to the village. Um, and it is sort of, I guess it, God, I'm going to sound so pretentious, but, you know, almost like growing up, you know, you're, you're in an island of yourself, you're with your parents all the time, everything you get is sort of in this small little world, then, you know, your world just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And with that comes more problems and more opportunities to also think things through. Oh, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, unlike the Minecraft books, it, it doesn't happen in steps. You know, it's sort of it, it keeps hitting you. You know, you're out in the world. You're figuring out how to be a citizen in society, which then makes you realize, oh, I've got to work on my interpersonal one on one relationships, which then make you realize, oh, wow, I got to work on myself. So and, and, and let's be very clear for any of your listeners. These are not lessons I have mastered. All right. These are lessons I'm still working on. I know they're right, but I ain't going to get on my rock, you know, with my toga and be like, listen to me. I have mastered all these lessons. No, I'm right in there with you. So uh, I'm I'm teaching, but I'm also the student. So that said, um, you know, I know there's a lot of different Minecraft books, different authors kind of have their different takes on them. Do you ever collaborate with the others or is everybody sort of um, an island in themselves? Yeah, no, we're all in our own world. I mean, I've been I've been saying for for years that we should do a big Minecraft authors panel at Comic-Con somewhere, you know, have us all because I have read I haven't had time to read all the Minecraft books, but I have read some and I really liked what I've read. They're all great writers in their own, you know, their own fields. So uh, just because I'm sort of doing it a different way doesn't mean it's any better than any of the other ones. So I think, you know, would ha- how cool would that be to have us all together and talking about why we all came to this world and why we're all doing it? Yeah, I really love that idea. And it makes me wonder, um, do you think this is a world that you'll ever return to? I know that you've literally just finished (laughs) in a trilogy, but do you think you might ever have more stories to tell in this world or be drawn back to it? I I honestly have no idea. Uh, I mean, at this point, I'm pretty clear that that I've come to what I think is the end of the road for me because, you know, live with yourself, live with other people, then become a citizen, but I have no idea. You know, I, I, I'm hoping that I'm going to be alive a little bit longer and I'm going to keep learning about this world and about myself. And if I, if I come to a new idea, I have left it open. Uh, my character, I, I won't spoil it, but my characters are still alive at the end of the book. So where there's life, there's hope. Maybe there will be another book sometimes, sometime later. But at this point, uh, the readers can close Minecraft the Village and feel satisfied. So before we wrap up, I'm just curious. So you mentioned the first book that you read cover to cover was a comic book. Yeah, so it was it was Rom Space Knight, and then someone gave me Eye of the Needle and um, Ken Follett, I believe it was, mm-hmm. Spy Story. Then, the, but the first book that I actually like bought and I just like went to the bookstore, put my money down and bought it was The Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy. And that changed my life because Clancy wanted to educate as well as entertain. And like I said, dyslexic kid, really struggled in school, always felt like the village idiot, but also cursed with curiosity. So I wanted to learn. And I always say school got in the way of my education. So I was always just looking, looking for ways to learn. And Red October, oh my God, I walked away from that book just feeling so much smarter than when I started. And I knew that's the kind of writer I wanted to be. I wanted to be the kind of writer where people would read my stuff and just say, oh, wow, I learned something. So that set me on on the course that I'm, I'm on now. And to kind of bring things uh, full circle, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about Tom Clancy when you mentioned him is that like, oh, he was so good at world building, you know, like even oh. though the world, like he built yeah. it well. And then I was like, 
literally what Minecraft is. <laughs> like it's all world building, you know, like, and that's what, what draws the kids in. And I think that's the part that also educates you too, because like you can't make a world real without like imparting some knowledge about it, you know? Yeah, you should, you should be learning something all the time. Uh, I mean, I, one of my favorite books to this day is still The Hobbit. And you could look at it as just a simple adventure, or you can look at it as an incredible morality story about a little person getting out of their little world and finding a, a much bigger life and conquering fear through adventure. I mean, my God, I, it still speaks to me. Uh, and not just because my little boy is now 18 and about to go into the world next year. And not because our late neighbor Orson Bean was the Hobbit in the old Rankin Bass cartoon that I literally grew up on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't say every story, you know, should learn something, um, but I think there is room for South Park and Family Guy. For sure. Thank you so much. This was super, super fun. I appreciate this so much. Thank you. This was a pleasure being here and, and thank you. God for libraries. Uh, I should say that on the subject of Minecraft, my favorite video game to this day is Sid Meier's Civilization. And I will tell you, your civilization cannot advance without building libraries. So let's keep building them. Let's keep funding them and let's defend them to the end. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You actually, it's so funny. I actually was going to ask you what your favorite video game was growing up. And then I was like, you know what? We're, we've got some good stuff going, but you, you, uh, you like pulled that question out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max Brooks. That was fantastic. Thank you. I, we, yeah, I'm a huge fan and I'm so glad we got to talk to you about these books. Thank you. Take care. Keep reading. And, and oh, anyone who hears this, oh, and by the way, you don't have to read with your eyes. My dyslexia drove me to audiobooks. We've got, I put all my books on audiobooks. I don't care what my teachers said in school. They're not cheating. It's, you can absorb a story any way your brain wants to. A hundred percent. And um, am I to believe, actually, so Jack Black narrates these books? Jack Black narrated the first one. Okay. And the second and the third are narrated by Sean Astin. Well, that's fabulous. And, and I'd love to say that it was just my grit and determination to seek them out, but I cheated because I went to high school with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a pass for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. All right. So uh, we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Take care, everyone. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.